www.thepatriotmedia.com. Welcome everyone to the new Fly Fisher. I'm Bill Spicer. And I'm Phil Rowley. On today's show, we're going to talk about fly fishing a new lake. We're going to teach you everything you need to know about fishing a new lake or improving your results on existing bodies of water you may be already fishing. It's going to be a great show, so get ready to take notes. We'll be right back. Let him go back to live another day. Oh, baby! Look at that fish. We talked earlier about having the optimum conditions. Here we've got perfect conditions. This is a good example of the family Heptogeneidae. This is why you need a lot of backing. The new fly fisher was made possible thanks to grants from Ontario, yours to discover. Orvis Guide Series Waders. The new Orvis Helios Fly Rods. Islander Precision Fly Rails. Scientific Anglers, the science behind your art. R.L. Winston Fly Rods. Sage Fly Rods. And viewers like you. On today's show, the new fly fisher crew is fishing the parklands near Russell, Manitoba. This area is renowned for its plentiful and abundant lakes filled with huge trout. Best of all, most of these lakes are within an hour's drive of each other with easy public access. The three species of trout we're after today are rainbow trout, brown trout, and the ever aggressive tiger trout. Let's wait for it to swing. A lot of it starts before I even leave the driveway. I'm going to look on the internet. I'm going to um, source out the lake, check out maybe some forms, see if there's any uh, bathymetric underwater contour maps available to me, find out all the information I can on the lake so I can already start formulating a game plan before I even get there. Then when I get on the lakeshore, I'm going to take a walk down to the shoreline. I'm going to look along the shoreline edges on um, things close to the shoreline, such as uh, cleaning stations, trees, spider webs for signs of a hatch. I'm going to look into the water. If there's a dock, I'm going to walk along there and have a look. I'm going to look out on the lake. I'm going to look for signs of moving fish, uh, interesting features, points of land, uh, little islands, those kind of uh, structure as well, to give me some kind of uh, idea where I'm going to go. And I'm already starting to make my game plan of flies I'm going to use, presentation techniques, and where I'm going to go. Nice of me to put position the truck like that. Eh? Phil, now in stream fishing, we do look for a few things to find fish. Is it the same with lakes? Can you explain to us what we need to look for? with fish where they prefer to be? Yeah, it's actually very similar. I use three factors myself, comfort, protection, and food. And comfort are those things like water temperature, uh, weather systems. Um, these, are, these are things that put the trout on or off the bite. Um, then there's protection, which uh, maybe in a river or stream behind a rock or under an undercut bank, those kind of things. In a lake, it's um, things like riffled water, um, algae, um, a proximity to deep water, those kind of things. So a lot of structure related stuff in that protection as well. 
Uh, and then there's food, and that's what as fly fishers, obviously, we're trying to imitate what they eat. So we need to put our flies where the food sources exactly. are. And that's generally water less than 20 feet deep, and that's because of the sunlight penetration, which stimulates weed growth, which then becomes the home base for all the insects and invertebrates and bait fish that trout uh, prey upon. And we actually look for prime lies, and that's something that contains comfort, protection, and food. And in still waters, for me, it would be a, a weed bed uh, adjacent to deep water, such as a sunken island, or the edges of a weed bed as it drops off into deeper water. Those are going to be real trout magnets and places we want to probe thoroughly with our flies. And there's a saying in, 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 on streams, when you're comfortable, the fish are comfortable. Exactly. So, you know, bright, hot days, likely, you're going to have very slow fishing. Yeah, or you're going to have to move to deeper water. You're right. going to have to adjust. You can't come to a lake and just assume because at this time last year um, they were in eight feet of water. Conditions can be totally different. And a bright day with little or no wind, it's going to drive them deeper. They're going to feel less secure in coming into the shallow. So you've always got to be versatile. You can't come to the water, whether it's a river, a stream, lake, the ocean, with a preconceived idea of what's going to happen. You've got to be observant. And, and be versatile and uh, play the hand that you're dealt. Right. And again, remember that leader sinks in that um, arch, that curved um, profile. It doesn't sink straight off the end of the fly line. So we need that 25% longer leader uh, to allow our flies to get down there. And wow, this guy's woken up. So I'm gonna get all this line up off the carpet here. Quickly get them up. Uh, fish is running towards me. I want to stay tight to the fish. So if he runs in, I stop. Don't lose concentration on the fish while trying to get your fly line up. But you want to try and clear the deck if you can so you don't accidentally step on things or break a fish of a lifetime off. Now we got him to the reel. And we'll just battle him from here. Pull him up from the depths. And we'll keep him away from the anchor rope. That's why on this boat, my anchors, I'm positioned when I anchor, I actually have the anchors trailing out behind and tried to do my level best to fight the fish out in front and that minimizes the chances of a bad encounter with the fish running and around the anchor rope. And again, this is another very nice uh, tiger trout. And they're really taking it, starting to really respond to this coronamid. Funny, some of these look, you can almost see the more brookie in them, and the other one you can see the more brown in them. So this one's, oh, this is a nice one. This is a very nice tiger. And again, whoa. He is not ready to come home yet. And again, you can see that coronamid, that white bead, right in the top jaw. That's a classic coronamid hookup, right top dead center, right into the... They're slippery little things. That is a gorgeous tiger. We'll just put him in the water, let him catch his breath. That one there is a good 20 plus inch tiger on a small coronamid. Yes, big flies, big fish sometimes, but also they need those staple food sources. Coronamids are some one in still waters every fly fisher should be familiar with. There he goes. There he is. A dead slow dri uh, twitch on this fly. Bob just handed it to me. It's his own design. And I'm using an intermediate sink line, and I'm finding out how strong these tiger trout are. They're extremely strong. He's, he's twisting me around. As you can see, oh yes, it's a decent fish too. And if I could trouble Bob to come over here, please. And I have no net. I've come prepared, I have no net. <laughs> this is uh, quite a hefty trout, and he's taking line out, and I am enjoying this. Put a little side pressure on, see what happens. Now, I've seen tiger trout once before in the United States. I never had the pleasure of catching one, so this, this is new for me. Oh, and he's not being kind to the camera. 
And Bob has one on too, so there's a reason why Bob can't come over and help me. Oh yes, this is quite a unique pattern on the side of these trout. Yeah, I'm gonna have to tire him right out and wait for Bob to land his. Yeah, these uh, the incredible size of these fish out here is is something. There's so much food in these lakes between the insect activity and the minnow activity. And wow, this is some strong fish. And I shall wait patiently for Bob to come over here. And I'll swing him around. In Manitoba, we fish the buddy system. <laughs> and if I could trouble you for that, Bob, thank you very much. Well, that's as far as we go. Okay, let's have a look at this little thing. Bob got my fly out for me with the buddy system. I couldn't get over there to get it out myself, so I'm gonna take them like so. When you hold them in the net, like so, it's very easy to hang on to them. What a unique pattern they have. They got an orange belly, kind of a, almost a striped side, spotted striped side. Very interesting fish. So we've got another tiger on here, little guy, not too bad. And how I got that is, is fishing a method uh, the English uh, perfected and Europeans called the hang. And as you bring in your fly up, I just let it pause and I lift the rod slowly with the leader and the fish just smacked the fly just as it was hanging there. It's, as that fly rises, it's almost um, too much for the fish to ignore. It's kind of like a still water version of Sawyer's induced uh, nymphing technique where you induce the take by raising uh, the line of the uh, fly right in front of the fish. Yeah. Oh, hold on, I just got to get the fly out of the fish. There we go. And here we go. It's not the biggest tiger in the world, but these things are sure aggressive and full of spunk and just some really unique colors. Whoop! And kind of hard to hold on to. <laughs> so we'll give a, another cast in that area again. So again, the hang. Hold on. I've got a fish here! <laughs> oh my god, look at that! <laughs> <laughs> well, this was different. I just finished releasing. This is an aggressive species of fish. I just finished releasing that one fish. The fly is hanging. I go to pick up my rod, and all of a sudden it's bent. There's a weight on it, and the fish has come in and smacked my little nymph. Sort of a caddis pupa generic looking pattern. I'll show it to you in a second, but these tigers are so aggressive. That was just hanging there. Oops, he's buried it right into his, like he, these, when they commit to the, they're almost like a tr salmonid equivalent of a pike. <laughs> you can see that beautiful coloration right there. And we're getting, this lake's reputed to have them well over 20 inches, so I'll be excited to get one of those. So we'll let him go back and get to be big. Off he goes. Very aggressive species. Fish the flies right to the boat. <laughs> Phil, let's talk a little bit about flies. Now, I know there's three basic flies that you should have for still water, which are scuds, coronamids, and leeches. Could you tell us a little bit more about them, what we need to, to look for in these flies? Certainly, Bill. Um, the first one I've got here is a box of my coronamids, or one of my boxes. I have a bit of a coronamid addiction. But down the left-hand side, or my left of the box, I have a selection of coronamid larval patterns, or bloodworm, as they're commonly known. A uh, very good pattern to fish throughout the season, uh, long life cycle and lots of species, so lots of opportunity for imitation. On this side here, and if I flip over, you'll see more here, quite a range of sizes and colors in coronamid pupa. And the pupa is the stage after the larva transforms and travels up to the surface. They use trapped air and gases to do this, so your patterns need to have a degree of shine to them to simulate that. Lots of different body colors, blacks, browns, 
shades of olives and mm -hmm. greens, lots of contrasting ribs, red wire, gold wire, copper wire, silver wire, lots of use of bead heads to help sink the pattern, uh, prominent white gills, whether they're yarn such as this, or white beads, which really work well in algae waters because they don't foul up with the algae. Okay. So that's a good basic coronamid selection. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a year-round food source or an all-season long yeah. food source. Now we got uh, scuds here. Tell me a little bit about them. Well, scuds are another staple there on, on these productive lakes here. Uh, for example, in Manitoba, they're just chocker block full of big gamorous and hyalella scuds. It's two families to consider, size being the only differentiator. Gamorous they look the, the same, just one's bigger yeah, than the other. Gamorous are the bigger ones. Yeah. And again, simple patterns, dubbed bodies, um, shellbacks on them of raffia, uh, midge flex. Um, pearl mylar, those kind of materials, bead heads on the front to help them get down a little bit in, in choppy water and give a little flash and sparkle, and uh, just a range of colors, predominantly greens, shades of olive green. Um, they match the bottom vegetation, so your fly mm -hmm. pattern selection should yeah. match those, so a good selection of scuds. Probably from a number 10 down through 16, and a number 12 would be a good average scud pattern to work. Now here's the leeches. Yeah, the next box here we have are the leech boxes, the, the big bushy ones, and I've also got some forage fish in here as well, which is another important food source in the Parkland region. But you can see an awful lot of marabou and rabbit used in here. That really w. moves in the water, doesn't yeah. it? It just comes to life, and we need that because the leech has that undulating yes. motion, and we need to imitate that. And we use lots of different colors, blacks, clarets, browns, olives, um, darker colors. You got to consider leeches are active in, in uh, low light conditions, so patterns that push water give a good acoustic footprint will be good right. too. Trout can hone in on them with their mm -hmm. lateral line. Mm -hmm. We've got a few minnow patterns up at the top here as well. We need to have those. In these lakes, we have fathead minnows, sticklebacks, so whatever lakes you're fishing, yeah. match, yeah. pick up. Uh, there's so many minnow patterns and bait fish patterns out nowadays, you just got to change its colors to yeah. match ones in your local waters. Now, you, the use of the marabou makes it look alive rather than an exact copy of what you're trying to, mm -hmm. to, to fish with. It usually yeah. doesn't work. You want something to look like it's alive and move in the water. Yeah, suggestive patterns are good as well. You can get patterns that look across between a scud and a leech and the fish, it's up to the fish to choose what it wants as long as it takes it. So yeah. suggestive patterns are very good for covering the water and, and sort of expanding your options. Right. We're, we're working on the fact that trout are opportunistic in nature and we want to choose flies that appeal to that to them. So they're not always selective. We can use a suggestive pattern to start, and then if we use a throat pump or get a little more information what they're on, uh, then we can get a little more finite and a little more maybe accurate representation. Okay. So that's a good starting point for the flies you want to carry. And then there's others. There's damselflies and dragonflies. And every lake, like every river and stream, right. has different hatch pot, sorry, different invertebrate populations. And some lakes have better caddis than others. And then we have damsel and dragon populations. Yes. So you're and always, that's through experimentation you find yeah. out if that's happening. Yeah, you'll build up a collection of flies in pretty short order. <laughs> <laughs> In addition to water temperature, other comfort factors to consider include barometric pressure and the effect of cold fronts. For example, when a cold front approaches, typically the barometric pressure drops. This tends to put fish off the bite. No one's quite certain why, but it definitely has a pronounced impact when we're still water fly fishing. One of the tactics I found to be successful is to move from perhaps shallower waters where we're working our flies in say 10 or 12 feet to the edges of drop-offs or perhaps out into deeper water say even into 18 or 20 feet. Here we use slow sinking lines, attractor style leech patterns and try to prey on the trout's naturally aggressive predatory nature to be successful. Other things to look for as well that affect oxygen content. We talked about temperature doing that but springs, weed beds, these all give off oxygen. Springs, underwater springs, cool water has a, a good dissolved oxygen content. Weed beds, because of photosynthesis during the day, plants respire, taking in carbon dioxide, giving off oxygen. This will attract fish to weed beds as well. So those are some of the comfort factors you need to consider when you're trying to find trout in still waters. This guy's taking line. Very good. What I was doing, folks, is uh, Phil actually was landing a fish, and I stopped to take a picture of his fish. And I had my line laying in the, and let it sink right to the bottom. And as soon as I picked it up and started retrieving it again, that's when the fish hit. So that shows the importance of getting the fly down to the bottom. 
Now, I haven't had a look at it yet, but it feels pretty strong. It's just big head shakes. And I have a two-fly system on right now. I have a leech, and I have one of uh, Bob Sheedy's special flies. He hasn't even named it yet. Uh, so I'm not sure which, which fly it took, but give a little side pressure to see if it comes. Man, is it ever shaking its head. And we have a double header. <laughs> and we have a double header. This is, this is exciting. These park lines are amazing, huh, Phil? Uh -huh. <laughs> double no, header. Double header, yeah. I'm just watching you fight your fish, and I had made a small cast, and, and uh, again, the naked technique, and just letting that fly swing, wind drifting, and it just took off. He just grabbed it. This time, he took the bottom fly, the leech. So again, as you touched on, Bill, the importance of depth and still waters. Get that fly as soon as it seems to get in the zone, and they're cruising through there, chances are you'll get uh, some positive response. Nice fish, Bill. Thank you. Now, this one isn't quite as, as uh, marked as the other ones. Uh, the, 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 it looks like there's a blotchiness on the side. These are quite unusual looking fish. Very, very good. This one's about, I would say, about 18 inches. Opposite of Bill's fish, I've got the most, probably one of the more colored fish we've, colorful markings of the day. And again, he took that, I thought he took the leech, but he took the black and red coronament again. So we may have the semblances of a hatch here. And here's mine, a little more colorful, a little more marked, sort of your stereotypical tiger markings. So we'll let that one go as well, and we'll continue to Use that coronamid and that naked technique. It's starting to produce. There we go. Fish on with the indicator. Just saw that draw under. And we have a fish. I'm not sure which fly it took yet, but it feels like a good fish. And again, that was just using 12 inch pull to pitch those flies up. There's a number of different techniques you can use when you're fishing the indicator. You can fish them static, just let them sit. The, or you could slow, slow hand twist retrieve. This one's really bulldogging. Or you can use what we're doing today because the fish are very active, that 12 inch pull, and then let it sit. And I, That's exactly what I did on this fish, is I draw, um, pulled on the line, drew that indicator toward me about 12 inches, let it settle, no sooner is it settled, and boom, under she went. This looks like a pretty good little tiger. Oh yes, this is a very nice tiger. He took the leech. We have a very nice look tiger over here. One looks like he's in a bit of a spawning colors or he's off to the dance somewhere. He's all dressed up in his best. Full of uh, fight here. Put the net down for a second. Worry about fighting the fish. And again, we may want to consider some line management here, just so I don't accidentally step on the. Um... Again, my primary concern when fighting this fish is stay tight to him, especially with these barbless hooks. Any kind of slack, and they can exploit that to the maximum. But that's a really nice tiger. There we go. Again, these are. We have run out of time, but be sure to watch for part two of New Lake Strategies with Phil Rowley and Bill Spicer. For more information on today's show and others in our series, visit us on the World Wide Web at www.thenewflyfisher.com. From all of us here at the New Fly Fisher, thanks for joining us. Tight lines, and we'll see you next time. The new Fly Fisher was made possible thanks to grants from Sage Fly Rods, R.L. Winston Fly Rods, Scientific Anglers, the science behind your art, Islander Precision Fly Rails, The new Orvis Helios fly rods.
Orvis Guide Series Waders. Ontario, yours to discover. And viewers like you. The new. Do you love fly fishing? Are you wanting to learn how to fly fish? Then subscribe to the new Fly Fisher online magazine. It's free. Each issue is filled with great stories, information on techniques, tackle, and fly patterns. You can view this magazine on your personal computer, smart tablet, or other device. Each issue contains great stories, photography, and instructional video. To subscribe, go to www.thenewflyfisher.com.